Hello, I'm Hannah Donnert with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Changeway is bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnerships, calls, webinars, science service, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's CHE EDC Strategies Partnership Webinar, which is titled Multi and Transgenerational Outcomes of an Exposure to a Mixture of EDCs or Endocrine Disrupting Chemicals on Puberty and Maternal Behavior in the Female Rat. Our moderator today is Jerry Heindel, Heindel Founder and Director of Commonweal's Health, Healthy Environment and Endocrine Disruptors, Disruptor Strategies. The webinar is one in a monthly series sponsored by the Collaborative on Health and the Environment and and the EDC Strategies Partnerships. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions to the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After our presentation, our moderator will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On our webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speaker. The webinar is scheduled to last for 30 minutes and is being recorded for a call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Jerry. Thank you very much, Anna. And welcome everyone to today's webinar that's going to highlight some very exciting research that focuses on key topics in the endocrine disruptor field. And those are the effect of mixtures, uh, transgenerational inheritance, and effects that skip a generation. And we're very pleased to have as our speaker today, Dr. Anne Simon Perron. Dr. Perron received her medical degree and PhD in biomedical science from the University of Liège in Belgium. She was a postdoc in the prestigious lab of Sergio Ojeda, where she studied the molecular determinants of the hypothalamic control of puberty. She then joined the Belgium National Foundation for Research as an associate researcher, and she is currently an associate professor in pediatric endocrinology and a principal investigator at Giga Neurosciences at the University of Liège. Her studies focus on bridging the gap between laboratory research and clinical studies. And her research group has developed models to study the effect of endocrine disrupting chemicals on the central nervous system and focuses on their effects on the hypothalamic control of puberty and reproduction and on hippocampus development. So with that, I turn the program over to you and Simone. Thank you very much, Jerry. Thank you, Hannah, um, for this kind of introduction and for this invitation. I think it's really a great webinar series and I'm really happy to be here today. I would also like to thank Jerry for his support and advice during um, this project. So I don't need to remind this audience that we are exposed every day to several dozens of endocrine disrupting chemicals. Some of them are non-persistent, such as bisphenol A of phthalates, and some of them, of course, are persistent, such as PCBs or flame retardant. And in accordance with uh, the developmental origins of health and disease, we know also uh, that there are some windows of sensitivity, such as the fetal life and also the early postnatal life. For several years, the gonades have been considered to be the main targets of endocrine disruptors. But we know now that the brain is also targeted by endocrine disruptors, which makes sense when we know that it is so sensitive to thyroid hormones and sex theories. In particular, when the hypothalamus is disrupted, it can lead to altered sexual behavior, to altered puberty or decreased fertility, or even maybe to the predisposition of some diseases such as PCOS. In the lab, we are interested in the hypothalamus control of puberty, and we know that puberty results from the reactivation of GnRH secretion from the hypothalamus. And you can see here individual profiles of GnRH secretion from hypothalamic exponents incubated individually. Uh, those are female rats, and you can see this acceleration of GnRH secretion before the onset of puberty. 
a reawakening of um, GnRH neurons around puberty is actually under the control of a tight network of genes. And the classical view postulates that the reactivation of the, these GnRH neurons depend on a decrease in, uh, gab in GABAergic or in inhibitory input onto GnRH neurons, but also in an increase in excitatory input onto GnRH neuron. And we can find here kispeptin neurons and glutamatergic neurons, for instance. And we will see that kispeptin is actually a major key factor responsible for the reactivation of those GnRH neurons. But more recent work by our collaborator, Alejandro Lominici, has recently shown that the reactivation of GnRH secretion, as illustrated here at the bottom of the slide, um, is actually accompanied by changes in DNA methylation and changes in uh, histone marks. And this is uh, observed at the level of the promoters of genes that are known to repress or activate puberty. So you can see here in the arcuate nucleus, you can see at the level of the promoters of genes that are known to repress GnRH secretion, you can see an increase in methylation together with a, an increase in repressing histone marks. And at the same time, you can see a decrease in red in activating histone marks. If you look at the level of the promoter of activating genes, such as KIS, KIS1, which codes for kispeptin, you can see an increase in activating histone marks and a decrease in repressing marks. So those epigenetic changes will actually control the transcriptional activity of key genes regulating GnRH secretion. And one can imagine, of course, that such epigenetic control of GnRH secretion would be sensitive to the environment. But do we actually have human data showing that uh, the environment can affect uh, the pubertal timing? You can see here the average menarchal, uh, menarchal age, so the age at which uh, the first menses take place between 1890 and 2010. Between 1890 and 1960, you can see that there has been a constant decrease in time in, in term of time at menarche. But age at menarche has actually stabilized since the 60s in the US and in Europe. So this decrease is considered to be or to have been associated with an improvement of um, the conditions of life and the nutritional status, but now it is um, almost completely stabilized. Interestingly, it's still decreasing in countries such as India and China. But if we look at the beginning of puberty for girls, which is marked by breast development, it is still decreasing. You can see those data here, summarized by Anders Yule, between the 80s and 2015. You can see this constant decrease that is observed in Asia, in Europe, or in the US. As you can see here in the US, we have now an average age at breast development or 8.5 to nine uh, years of age. It might actually be a little more complex than just a trend toward precocity. And those are actually Belgian data that we collected on more than 2000 girls, where we looked at uh, the cumulative percentage of girls reaching onset of puberty, meaning breast development, B2, or reaching the end of puberty marked by menarche. If the distribution of age at onset of puberty was normal or Gaussian, we would actually have the same time between the earliest to enter puberty and the mean than we would have between the mean and the latest to develop. But that's not the case. You can see that the distribution is actually skewed toward earliness when we look at the onset of puberty. And when we look at the end of puberty, it's actually skewed toward lateness. And we have reported the same for boys, actually. So there are some data suggesting that there is a trend in terms of normal timing of puberty. And such a quick and fast trend cannot be explained by genetic factors. It, it suggests a role for the environment. Do we have data suggesting that there is also an effect on environment on pathological conditions, such as a central precocious puberty, so puberty resulting from the activation of the hypothalamus and the pituitary? Well, that's actually the case here in the Danish data, where you can see this very strong increase in terms of incidence of abnormal precocious uh, central puberty. 
those data is actually are actually scarce, um, but similar data have been reported in uh, South Korea and also in France. So we have human data supporting the fact that there is a secular trend in uh, the timing of puberty and potentially a role for the environment. Now, of course, you know that we also have data in animals models showing that endocrine disruptors can affect uh, puberty. And you can see here some of our older data with bisphenol A, where we exposed female rats for 15 days postnatally to a very low dose and a high dose of bisphenol A. Um, and you can see that the, the high dose, as expected, led to early vaginal opening and early onset of puberty, which was consistent with an acceleration of the maturation of GnRH secretion. The low dose of 25 nanogram per kilogram per day actually led to delayed onset of puberty and delayed maturation of GnRH secretion. Using RNA sequencing and uh, functional assays, we could actually show that this delayed maturation of GnRH secretion was associated with an increase in GABAergic output, output onto GnRH neurons. So we have data suggesting that endocrine disrupting chemicals can actually affect the hypothalamic control of puberty. But of course, you know that we are not exposed to one single compound every day, but to uh, complex mixtures, as it is illustrated here in Tracy Woodruff's study in California, where each bar represents one pregnant woman. And you can see that all of them have at least 27 chemicals on a given day during pregnancy. So we got interested in, in mixtures, and we also got interesting, interested in um, transgenerational effects of uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals. Because you know that female rats prefer males that had not been exposed to vinclozolin ancestrally. We also know that uh, male rats, F3 generation after exposure to vinclozolin, show anxiety-like behaviors and also decreased um, mobility of the sperm. And this is associated with altered um, transcription or DNA uh, methylation in the target organs. Those transgenerational effects are not limited to reproduction. Here is an example of um, exposure to tributyltin leading to diet-induced obesity in the F3 and F4 generation. And this is also associated with specific plasma metabolomic uh, fingerprints. So this is the reason why we got interested in um, transgenerational effects. So David Lopez in the lab was doing his PhD and we chose um, to use a mixture that had actually been designed and used by the Danish uh, Technical University. This is a mixture of 13 compounds and you can see that each of them was described as antiandrogenic or estrogenic. For each of those compounds, we actually had data um, saying that or showing that there had been endocrine disruption uh, in vivo after exposure. And we also had data about human uh, exposure available. So to choose, to choose the doses that were used and that aimed at um, reproducing human exposure, uh, the, the Danish Technical University used the point of departure index, meaning that the doses were chosen based on a human uh, level of exposures and also on the null for um, given endpoints. These mixtures was known to affect um, anogenital distance in males after in utero exposure, and it was also shown to alter the estrous cycles in female after in utero exposures. There had been some um, adaptation, for instance, or adjustments. For instance, you can see here that only two phthalates were used, but the doses were a little higher in order to represent the whole group of phthalates to which we are exposed. You can see also that there was only one triazole, but again, the doses represent the whole family of the, the triazole uh, fungicides. We had BPA also, uh, UV filters, and acetaminophen. So David exposed the F0 females two weeks before mating, during gestation, and during lactation. Then he looked at maternal behavior in those F, F0 females, but also F1, F2, and F3 females. And he looked at pubertal development and estrocyclicity all the way down 
to the F4 uh, females. So what we're looking at here is the cumulative percentage of females um, reaching vaginal opening. And what is striking first is that puberty in females, in F1 female, was absolutely normal. So there was no effect of, of the mixture on puberal timing, no effect either on GnRH secretion. But then when we look at F2, F3, and F4 females, you can see that systematically vaginal opening um, and puberal onset is delayed. And this is consistent with a delay in the maturation of GnRH secretion as illustrated here by this increase in GnRH interpulse interval. So we did have an effect on puberal onset uh, that seemed to indicate um, an effect on the hypothalamic control of puberty. And David looked at those females later on, and the F2 and F3 also showed irregular cycles. Only 50% of the female had regular Easter cycles of four days. The females also showed a decrease in primordial follicles and an increase in natriuretic follicles, as well as a tendency to develop some cysts. So we wanted to identify some potential hypothalamic targets at the level of the hypothalamus. So David, in collaboration with Alejandro Lominici at Oregon Health and Science University, conducted an RNA sequencing in the F3 females and validated those data using real-time PCR. We are looking at three different time points, postnatal day six, 21, and 60. And very strikingly, what we can see is a strong decrease in some key genes known to be involved in the onset of puberty. One is KISS1, the gene coding for kisspeptin, this key factor initiating puberty, ESR1, coding for the estrogen receptor, and oxytocin was, that is also known to stimulate GnRH um, secretion. Then it, um, using chromatin immunoprecipitation, uh, David could show that it was absolutely consistent with the changes in uh, histone marks at the level of the promoters of those genes. So you can see here at the level of the KISS1 promoter, you could see an increase in repressive histone marks and a decrease in activating histone marks consistent with the decreased expression of KISS1 and consistent also with the delayed maturation of GnRH secretion. We could also see a decrease in activating histone marks at the level of the promoter of ESR1 and oxytocin. So we now had some data showing a transgenerational mechanism for um, epigenetically modifying the reactivation of GnRH secretion around puberty. But we know also that the hypothalamus, of course, is involved in the control of maternal behavior and parental motivation. We know that dopaminergic neurons in the AVPV and the preoptic area actually stimulate oxytocin neurons in the PVN. This will lead to the activation of maternal behavior. And when David looked at maternal behavior in the F1 females after a neutero exposure to the mixture, he showed that they significantly spend less time licking their pups. They also spend more time resting alone rather than taking care of the pups. We did RNA sequencing again in the hypothalamus. Again, at three different time points, we validated using real-time PCR, P6, P21, and P60. And what we can see is actually a decreased expression of tyrosine hydroxylase, which is uh, coding for the enzyme responsible for dopamine synthesis, and also this decreased transcription of two markers of dopamine um, activity, DNM1 and DARP32. So this is actually consistent with an alteration of the development of the dopamine circuit in the uh, hypothalamus. This is also consistent with what he found um, using immunohistochemistry with a decreased expression of the tyrosine hydroxylase in the preoptic area after um, exposure to the mixture. And you can see that it's specific, it is specific to the preoptic um, area. Such changes were actually observed all the way down to the F3 generation as well. What we could see also was a potential explanation with an increased um, in inhibitory uh, histone marks at the level of the promoter of the tyrosine hydroxylase 
uh, gene and also an increase in methylation. So what we know so far is that um, the F2 females after ancestral exposure to the mixture showed delayed onset of puberty and so did F3 and F4 females, but the F1 female had normal puberty. What we also knew is that according to our hypothesis, the development of the dopaminergic circuits involved in maternal behavior was altered by in utero exposure to the mixture, and so abnormal or impaired maternal behavior was observed in the F1 all the way down to the F3 generation. And we know that pubertal timing can actually be affected by abnormal uh, maternal behavior. So our initial hypothesis was that maybe F1 pubertal development was normal, but then because of abnormal maternal behavior, puberty was also becoming uh, abnormal. And in order to answer this question, we actually used cross-fostering. So F0 females were exposed to the mixture, F1 females then got pregnant, and then the F2 pups were cross-fostered in order to be raised by mothers who had been exposed in utero to the mixture or, or who had not been exposed to the mixture. So what did, you, what did we see? Well, what you're looking at here in green is the females, the F2 females uh, that were exposed ancestrally, but raised by control females. The orange bar represents exposed F2 females raised by exposed F1 female. Then light gray, you can see control unexposed F2 females raised by um, exposed F1 females and then control F2 raised by F1, F, um, F1 control females. What we can see is that being raised by a mother with normal behavior does not correct the pubertal phenotype. So the females still have delayed puberty. They also still have decreased expression of KISS1, ESR1, and oxytocin um, mRNA expression. And you can see here that it's still consistent with the pattern of the histone marks being um, inhibitory or activatory. This indicated a germline transmission basically because the cross-fostering could not correct the phenotype. What is interesting is that when we did the cross-fostering, actually maternal behavior was corrected in the F2. So the F2 females adopted by control mothers were then showing normal maternal behavior we're actually showing normal expression of tyrosine hydroxylase and normal um, histone marks. So if we want to summarize, we know now that the pattern of pubertal timing has been changing toward precocity, but maybe also toward delay, depending on the endpoint we are looking at. And it had been shown in both males and females. There is some data suggesting also that central precocious puberty seems to increase with time, and it is actually more prevalent in females, which, which suggests a role for environmental factors. This could be nutrition, it could be psychosocial stress, but also endocrine disrupting chemicals. And using this mixture, we have shown different um, transgenerationally, transgenerational effects with two different modes of, of transmission, and that's maybe one of the take-home uh, messages. So first, we showed an altered maternal care that was observed from F1 to F3 generation. It was associated to a loss in hypothalamic tyrosine hydroxylase expression, probably caused by an increase in histone marks and an increase in uh, CPG island methylation at the level of the promoter of tyrosine hydroxylase. And this um, alteration was actually transmitted through learned behavior as shown by the cross-fostering experiment. Then we had delayed puberty that was not observed in the F1, but then appeared in the F2 all the way down to the F4 generation actually. And here we could show an epigenetic reprogramming of key hypothalamic genes that are known to activate genary secretion and this was associated with an increase in repressive histone marks and a decrease in activating histone marks. And here we could show a germ cell uh, inheritance. 
But as I said earlier, and as I, Jerry said, actually, the F1 generation at normal puberty and normal follicular genesis, the phenotype um, only appears in F2 and F3 generation. And there are actually quite few uh, studies really comparing F1 and F3 uh, generations strictly. You can see one here uh, by the Skinner team also showing that after exposure, exposure to glyphosate, uh, ovarian disease actually only appears in the F2 and F3 generation. Puberty is only delayed in the F2. And you can see that the frequency of more than two diseases in females, again, is significant, significantly increased uh, in the F2 and the F3 generation. And that seems to be very relevant when we think about testing. If we wonder how to test those chemicals, we probably need to go further than the first generation. So is this data relevant for human puberty and reproduction? I tried to show in the introduction that secular trend in pubertal timing is probably a little more complex than just a trend toward precocity. And then that might be consistent with our data showing actually that exposure to bisphenol A directly or transgenerational exposure to this mixture tend to lead to delayed onset of puberty. What we can also wonder is, is this altered puberty a marker of later subfertility? We can see that those females had irregular hysterocycle and abnormal follicular genesis, and we are actually currently looking at their fertility. And then of course the design we used did not represent human, uh, human situation because we are exposed across our lifespan and every generation is, is exposed. So we could also actually observe uh, greater effects. And then there is this question of misadaptation uh, that was raised by Dr. Levin in, our, uh, in the comment of, about our paper. We know from Gluckman and from Barker that an organism that is developing in a scarce environment in terms of uh, food availability, for instance, will be prone to obesity if later on he or she is exposed to a more favorable environment. And this could be mediated by epigenetic mechanisms. So here maybe those epigenetic mechanisms could also explain that we adjust to the environment we are exposed to during development. But then this uh, toxic environment is constantly changing and we might be misadapted to the next, um, the next chemicals. And this is actually rarely explored. In terms of perspectives, we will, of course, need to identify the culprit. We have used the mixture. We don't know which compounds are responsible for the phenotype. And we, we will need to look at prolonged exposure closer to what humans um, experience. We would also like to characterize mRNA expression and chromatin conformation in specific neuronal population in F1 and F3 generation, looking at oxytocin neurons, for instance, or kispeptin neurons. And what Delphine Franzen, a postdoc in the lab, has recently shown is that those female of the F3 generation after ancestral exposure to the mixture are prone to gain more weight when they're exposed to high fat diet. So we also wonder if those F3 females could show more of a metabolic phenotype and maybe develop something that would look like polycystic ovarian syndrome. So I would like to thank you for your attention. I would like to thank a very talented uh, PhD student and now postdoc, David Lopez, who was also helped by uh, Dr. Fransen, who was also a very talented postdoc in our lab. They were helped by um, Arlette Gerard. This work would not have been possible without Alejandro Lominici and his team at Oregon Primate Research Center in Portland. And I would like also to acknowledge our funding and I thank you very much again for your attention and for this invitation. Okay, well, thank you very much. <clears throat> that was terrific and I, I learned a, a lot. So I, I've got a couple of questions. Oh, just on the beginning, um, it's just a general question. The, the fact that breast development is still decreasing in women, 
but Mensi's development is not. What is that telling us? It must be telling us something about differential control or maybe differential effects of chemicals or something. Yeah, abs absolutely. I think I think we're looking at different things when we're looking at um, at breast development and when we're looking at dementia, because breast development could be a marker of probably pretty recent exposure to some compounds, possibly estrogenic compounds, of course. And I think when we look at dementia, we actually look at the effect on the hypothalamic control of puberty, really, and we're probably looking more at central effects. And if you look at it, basically, we could say that puberty or adolescence is getting longer and longer, if we want to look at it at, uh, that way. Mm -hmm. So what I'm wondering on, on this situation of no effects in the F1, the more things you could measure that aren't affected, the stronger the case would be. That so is true. you said puberty, and then at, at the very end, you said the folliculogenesis was also OK. So are there other things that are OK, but that are affected later? Did you try anything else? So we, we tried, um, we looked at the Easter cycle. That was also uh, perfectly fine. Um, yeah, folliculogenesis. And then, and then weight gain also was, uh, was comparable in exposed and non-exposed in the F1. Um, that's, that's pretty much, and in terms in term of also of, of uh, transcriptional activity, we also had, um, no effect on the in the F one basically in the hypothalamus. Great. Great. So uh, I was happy to see you mentioned something at the end because uh, in your gene studies, I noticed the effect of POMC and CART, and so then I was going to ask you about any weight changes. So this the situation with the high fat diet you just did that in what what generation was that so that was the f3 generation mm -hmm. the same one that showed the the um, differential effects in terms of of pomc expression and so on mm -hmm. um we did not we also looked delphine recently looked at the effect of leptin on appetite in that generation there we don't see any effect but definitely, yeah, the, this, this increase in those um, neuropeptides involved in the hypothalamic control of, of appetite is something we would like to look into more. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So that sort of matched uh, what Bruce Bloomberg showed, yes. right? Yes, For the absolutely. tributyl tin in the F3. Yes. Well, there was nothing really going on when you added the high fat diet. The sensitivity to the toxicant showed up. Yes, yeah, that's absolutely. that's really an important uh, finding, I think. In fact, that you can mimic his, that's really neat. Let's see if we have a couple of questions here. Uh, there's one that's okay. Somebody said, Is there another interpretation of the cross fostering data that behavioral environment? can counteract or correct EDC epigenetic effects rather than concluding the behaviors were only behaviorally transmitted. Okay, I don't really understand that, but maybe you do. <laughs> that whole cross-fostering part was a little bit confusing to me. So maybe you could kind of go through that and, and, and answer this question of, if you can. Right. Um, I, I, I hope I will. <laughs> I think um, so you, when we do when we do the, 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 the cross fostering, so basically we have um, F2 females who were ancestry exposed or not to, to the compound, and then they were adopted by females who had never seen the mixture, basically. And our interpretation what is really consistent is basically the fact that in terms of behavior, when we give the ancestrally exposed female 
to an exposed mothers, then the F2 behavior is normal. The F1 is normal, F2 is normal. And in terms of um, the dopaminergic circuits, what we looked at is also normalized. So that was our hypothesis that um, that was not due to, to the fact of having been exposed as germ cells, because that was not the question anymore, but the, the explanation was then the abnormal behavior and not the ancestral exposure. That's the way we looked at it. Okay, great. So what's next? Where, where are you going to take this next? What, which of the interesting findings are you going to follow up on? Well, what, what we are very interested in right now is really trying to see if, if what the females are developing is something that looks like PCOS, which would be very relevant also in terms of public health. And there the challenge um, with high fat diet, I think is also relevant. So that's what we are trying to, to see. When we look at the F3 generation, in terms of fertility, what we found is rather subtle. So they're not strongly infertile, that's for sure. But what we are looking at right now is what about if they're exposed to high fat diet? Does it actually worsen their uh, ability to ovulate and so on? So that's what we are um, looking at. And then um, uh, what we would also like to look at is we would like to have a more cellular or cell-specific resolution of what we have um, identified in, in terms of, of mechanisms. So basically looking at specific cell population for the behavior, looking at mm -hmm. um, dopaminergic neurons or oxytocin neurons and, and kisspeptin maybe for puberty. Mm -hmm. So that's the two directions we would like to go to. So what maybe one last one. The, um... In the, the original studies from the, the uh, Danish, was it Danish? Yes. Did, did they measure puberty in, in the F1? Yes, they did, and it was, not, it was not affected. So similar to what we have found, yes. So they did puberty that wasn't affected in the F1 either. Right, no. Yeah. Okay, so that's another yes. that yes. Matches, matches yours. Okay, I think uh, that's all of the, 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 the key questions here. So I'll turn it back now to Hannah. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Perron and to you, Jerry. We're approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on Shay's website soon. And tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. The webinar is, is one in a monthly series sponsored by the Collaborative and Health and the Environment's EDC Strategies Partnership. The CHE EDC Strategies Partnership is co-chaired by Char Charles Patton, Director of Commonweal's Biomonitoring Resource Center, Jerry Heindel, Founder of the, and Director of Commonweal's Healthy Environment and Endocrine Disrupting Strategies, Janan Jensen, Executive Director of the Health and Environment Alliance, Sarah Howard, Founder of Di DiabetesEnvironment.org, and myself, Program Manager of Commonweal's Collaborative and Healthy Environment. Next, on October 7th, CHE will be hosting a webinar on Delta and reducing airborne transmission in schools. Details will be shared shortly. Stay tuned. If you're new to CHE and would like to stay, stay updated with upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars bringing the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speaker, Dr. Perron, for taking time to present today, and to you, Jerry, for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day. Stay well and healthy.